Hello, everyone, and welcome to the What's With Health and Care podcast. This is episode 20. And um, what we wanted to do was invite another one of our healthcare friends along in the form of a Beck from Tasmania, who is a coach and um, really works in that compassion fatigue space as well. So we thought what a great opportunity to come together and talk about compassion fatigue again, but from another perspective using, um, you know, Beck's perspective and her personal experiences and everything as well to sort of, you know, just shine another sort of lens and go over that again. So I'd love to say hello to Celeste, who's with us today from Rockhampton, as always. Um, However, she's out on the farm and um, the battery power is not um, strong with her today because she's getting some work done out there and they've got no power. So Celeste will be a face and pop in occasionally if her battery allows it. And is that okay, Celeste? Yeah, there that's fine. Hi, everyone. Great to be here again this morning in the windy, bracewell, bracing morning. Nice and cool up here. So, um, yeah, great to be here. And hi, Beck. Great to have you with us today. I'm going to hand over to Beck and say, Beck, introduce you to yourself to the What's With Health and Care friends and um, tell us a bit about yourself and where you're from and what you're doing. Well, thank you both for having me here, first of all. What a wonderful opportunity. Um, So I am in Tasmania, originally from Victoria, um, and I worked for 13 years as a veterinary nurse. So a little bit opposite to what you guys did in human nursing, I did the the animal side of caring. And um, and I then was diagnosed with fibromyalgia um, and that took me on a journey to become a health and wellness coach, um, which I decided to focus a lot on compassion and compassion fatigue, um, particularly in the animal care industry and supporting um, the people in that space um, around compassion fatigue and burnout and how to try to alleviate that as much as possible. Yeah. And how's that going down in Tassie with your work with compassion fatigue? Yeah, it's definitely taken its time um, to get off the ground, um, but it's not something that um, I'll give up on because it's just such a beautiful space to be in. And I believe not only people in the animal care industry, we know so many people, carers, um, nurses, doctors, specialists, allied health carers go through compassion fatigue at some stage in their life um, or they're more susceptible to it. So um, I think it's a really important area to focus on. Oh, and definitely like that that energy that because when people are caring and it, it really doesn't matter if it's animals, humans, you know, whatever it is that you're caring for. It's that balance of, am I caring so much for the other thing in my world and forgetting that, you know, I do need to care for myself in that balance as well. And how do I integrate that in a way that feels a comfortable and authentic to me that I can still have the energy I need to care outwardly for the things I care for. And it's that balance thing, isn't it, Beck and Celeste? I yeah. find, yeah, when I'm working out there yep. in, in the lands with people, I find that people just, yeah, it's that so busy focusing their care out, the care in is just never happening. What is that? Yeah, and the more you look around, the more you see it. I'm sure that's what you're noticing, Beck, that's making you um, want to sort of hang in there with the compassion fatigue awareness because the more we tune in, the more we see it. There's a lot of people that are suffering with it um, in terms of not being able to prioritise themselves or not feeling empowered or um, or not being even aware that, that they need to fill their cup up to keep caring for those around them. Uh, yeah, whether they're professionals or whether they're caring for someone or a pet or whoever at home. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think when you, um, I think the biggest uh, speed bump I come up against is people feeling that they don't have the time to focus on themselves to do coaching 
um, in that space of how am I going to fit that coaching session in when I'm already like so abundantly full and I'm giving so much compassion. And I think a lot of people in the animal care industry, particularly, you'll notice that they're vets or nurses or animal shelter staff working in that space. But then outside of that space, they're a carer for a family member or a pet or um, their own um, friends as well. So I think that, you know, they're such kind, empathetic, compassionate people. It's not just in the workplace, it's at home, but then it's struggling to hold on. I do need to help myself, but how can I find that time to help myself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's also tuning into self to notice that it's happening, like, you know, I notice with um, when I go and the work I'm doing is we actually, I, I get everybody to measure themselves using, there's a lot of validated tools out there. So, you know, if you find yeah. one and you sort of stick with it. And I know when I get people to do it and I say, like, we're going to start today. Just, I just want to see what your fatigue's doing. How does it measure up? You know, and people like they do this thing and they they sit there and then we, we, we sit and we debrief that because a lot of people are really shocked at their scores so because they they don't take a lot of time to reflect inwardly and go I'm fatigued you know so then when they get these numbers back yeah they're they're surprised Mm, and I think a lot of people as well feel that they might not understand the difference between burnout and comp- compassion fatigue. So you'll lot of, hear a lot of people say, I'm burnt out, I'm burnt out. But um, when you then get them to do that, you know, that sheet and that survey and go, well, actually, where am I? Some people might not be burnt out. They might be at the compassion fatigue stage. Um, and some people might have burnout and not compassion fatigue. So it's also understanding those different definitions um, that, that are there as well. Yeah, to talk to people and create a space for them to look at themselves. It is it is a beautiful thing, but also really confronting at the same time to recognize that everything I do is hurting me a little bit. Yeah, and I think that's something I've experienced myself. Um, and I think I don't know about your Celeste, but when I was, you know, initially diagnosed with fibromyalgia and I had to actually start giving myself compassion and allowing people to give me compassion, I felt very vulnerable in that space and um, almost fearful and anxious about allowing people to give compassion to me and, mm-hmm. and what their thoughts are going to be, how how they might see me as a person, um, but then also how I was able to give myself compassion and do that without judgment of any form. Oh, mm, I can agree with you there, Beck. It does take a bit of courage and um and I think it sort of starts with being able to give ourselves compassion and seeing in seeing that we deserve it. Uh, before we can accept it from anybody else. Mm. Yeah, I was just having this conversation yesterday with this amazingly experienced person who has, um, she's on a bit of a journey at the moment. And it was, she said to me, so why do I value myself less than the other people I care for? And I, like, that was her mm. words. And I just went, that's a great question. Can I ask you to think on that for a bit longer? You know, mm. and she said, I just, I don't know. Why, why does everyone else, everyone else's care and needs appear above mine? You know, and, mm. and I went, isn't that the best curious question that anybody can bring to themselves, you know? What do you think, Beck? Mm. Did you find that in yourself that you, you wondered why everybody else got care in front of you? I think um, I was a carer from such a very young age. So I've been caring for my dad with PTSD since I was probably about 14. And my mum had also ongoing illnesses. Um, So I think it's just been natural for me to step up into that space of caring and that expectation that I had to be that carer. Um, 
but yeah, when I had fibromyalgia and I had to start, yeah, caring for myself, it was why can't I um, allow myself to care for me when I'm okay and more than happy to care for everyone else in my life um, and give that love and kindness and empathy out, you know, to them. Um, but I definitely struggled with doing it internally and, and I had to do it very authentically. I think that's important as well that we are in a vulnerable stage when we're talking about compassion, especially when we're giving it, we're receiving it, and then we're giving it to ourselves. It's a very vulnerable space. And um, I think we have to be very authentic when we're doing it and not do it for someone else, not become compassionate because someone else tells us to be compassionate. I think we have to be compassionate because we want to be in that space and, and, and be able to care for ourselves and nurture and love ourselves and, yep. and be able to do that for others and receive it from others as well. Yep. Yep. I really like that point you just made of doing it authentically, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, not just doing it because it's the right thing to do and, you know, because someone's telling you to do it, doing it because you actually genuinely feel like the cup is empty and you're going, I know if I want to keep, being me and caring for people because this is the thing where the people we we're working with they want to care they're they're built to care you know they are programmed to care they love going to work every day and caring don't they you know so yeah we want, yes we want them to keep going we want them to keep caring so how can we help them and you know help them to relieve their loads so that they have more energy to do all the care they do, you know? Yeah, and I think that's where coaching is such a great space because we can really hold space, Mm. you know, with them. We can ask them these beautiful open-ended questions and then we can hold that space for them to really explore and discover that within themselves. Why do I really want to do this? Why is this really important to me that I connect and and make sure I balance my compassion out better? Um, you know, what's my life going to look like once I've got that balance in place and and I maintain that balance? You know, I mm-hmm. think there's some that's some great things that coaching brings to the table when it comes to compassion and compassion fatigue. Yeah, mm. definitely. What about you, mm. Celeste? What are you finding out there? Do you find that as well? Yeah, look, I'm right there with Beck. I think um, there's a misconception that being having self-compassion is being selfish or being self-centred and that when we do that, we're taking the focus away from the people who we see as needing it more than we do. And so it can be a bit of a vicious circle like that. So it's really, you know, when we, ha- when we can enter that space as a coach and as Beck said, just sort of hold that, um, hold that space open for people to contemplate and think about it. We we validate that they are worth, you know, needing to look after themselves because that's going to help the people that they're caring for. Um, but sometimes we need permission somehow, or we need some validation to help us along that path. Yeah, permission. Mm. Permission is an interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah, that? it's at some at some level. Like, there's probably another word for it, but oh um, no, no, I think that's a really good word. Um, but I think that's the perception somehow. Yeah. We, we can't we can't allow ourselves, but if someone else can suggest it and and let us step back and see the difference that it might make, and that that's actually going to help somebody else as well as us, uh, then that sort of makes it all right. Does that make sense? Oh. One hundred percent. If I can, uh, because yeah, you know, the people want to keep doing what they're doing, but they want to yes. do it with, they want to do it with more ease and grace. You know, they don't want to feel so exhausted all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just sneaks and up I on think, us, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that permission comes from that that conditioning that we have, you know, from early on in our childhood. You know, we do have to ask permission for things. Um, we do have to ask permission and acknowledge that. And then we also uh, are taught from a very early age to to um, share your things, be kind to people. Um, you know, it's it's how we're brought up is we're taught as a child all those things of, you know, but we're never taught really um, until now where it's coming into the world of what self-care and self-compassion really is and that we don't need permission for it. We can give that 
Um, but so many of us feel that from that conditioning, that permission has to come from someone of authority almost. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like our bosses, our bosses, you know, and that's why when you look at um, pe- groups that do c- really good compassion fatigue, sort of awareness and practices in workplaces, it's because sometimes it does have the, it has that organisational leadership team involved in it. And it has those leaders who are role modelling some of the behaviour and going, okay, guys, it's five o'clock, closing the door, I'm heading home, need all of you to head home too. Come on, you know, let's go and, you know, um, let's go home and let's live our live our lives at home now. Work's finished for the day. So you see some of that role yeah. modeling. Um, or you I, see teams get forming walking groups or peer support groups, actually having conversations about how I'm feeling, truly feeling at work. I mean, how awesome is that? Yeah, it's great. And it's like um, we're getting more of a do as I do. <laughs> not just as I say, because if we say one thing, particularly as leaders, but we're doing something else and we're still staying back all hours, that's setting the bar. That's what everybody's seeing as well. They're saying this, but this is what they're doing and actions speak louder than words. So it won't quite have the impact as if um, you have the activities organisation like you were just talking about. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah, so I think... I think leading with compassion is really important because then, as you said, it does give everyone this expectation of if this is where I am. So, and doing it together. So teaching everyone in that space, educating, supporting them, nurturing them that it's okay to freely express how you're feeling with no judgment. Um, Be heard, be heard by your leader in that space. Um, have your breaks. How many times in the nursing industry of any form have we missed our breaks because, you know, I just can't do it. There's too much to happen. If I don't do it, everything's going to fall down. Well, actually, you can have that break, you know. Um, Someone else just needs to be in that space as a leader to support you to have that space, um, to have that break. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that compassionate leadership is so vital in, you know, organisations and teams really, you know, looking out for each other and just saying, you know, oh, you you know, uh, if I worked with you, Beck, I would say, Beck, are you okay? You're just looking a bit tired today. You know, is everything okay? And then stopping and listening to your response to sort of check in, are you okay? Yeah, and I think that's the difference between um, leading for your team and leading with your team. Yeah. Because if you're in front of your team and you're leading them and you're just expecting them to follow, that is a complete different leadership style than actually let's be a compassionate leader, let's stand with our team and be the strength with them and support them forward with compassion. Um, I think, yeah, Mm -hmm. there's a big difference Mm -hmm. in that leadership space. Yeah, it is really interesting, isn't it? And I, I don't know, I, I, I guess because I'm working so much in health at the moment and I'm hearing some of the personal stories of people who are really, um, they, yeah, they're, they're having things happen to them which are really indicating that they're not supported and that they're not heard. And, you know, and and then how can they sort of, change what they're doing to try and increase their voice um, because they do want to stay where they are. And so it is, I don't know, it is really hard for people who are struggling, they're in a fatigue space, but they're also genuinely wanting to be, for it to be different, um, you know, and that's where I just, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the easy way, I guess is probably how this waffle's going. I don't know the easy way of how to support people to, to, you know, have the courage, I guess, to say, I want this to be different. Can we get this different? I want to have more time to have conversations about how we're feeling here, working here. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It, and it is a hard one to stand up and, and say that to to your boss or your manager. Yeah. Um, I think I've been in I've been in that position myself and I think we probably all have where we've really felt like there needed to be a change in our in our work life. 
so that we can balance life together. But we didn't know how we can um, do it. And I think the best thing is to to find a colleague that can support you in that space that you can go to and say, look, I am really struggling, but I don't feel like I actually can talk to the, the manager or the boss by myself. Um, do you mind coming with me and, and having that conversation and, and supporting me in that space? Because, you know, I really feel like without that I'm, I am struggling. And I think there is everyone, someone in the workplace that you can connect with generally. You know, there's that one person that you have that conversation with, you know, that you feel a bit comfortable with, that, that you know, they're happy to support you to go to the, someone, uh, yep. a superior of mm. some form. Yeah, that's mm. a good solution, Beck. Definitely a good solution because there is this, yeah, there is this language breakdown that happens when, you know, I know I've had it, like, because I've had fatigue and I have had burnout in my life. So, and I know when I was in that zone and I was really tired and exhausted, I, my communication skills became super emotive and I became mm-hmm. really emotional in the way I approached everything and I, and I sort of, yeah, it was on the attack a lot. So mm. that I think is something to be mindful of when you are really fatigued. How can I just detach myself from my emotions for a minute and look at the facts? And then that will improve myself to have that conversation that's needed as well. Mm. Yeah. And I think um, it's also another thing of being emotional, um, understanding people's emotions in the workplace. So if you see your team member changing, if you see that they're, you know, super responsive in, in that space and that, you know, they're a lot more emotionally empowered or they're not showing emotion around um, different spaces as well. Like, you know, I know for um, particular in the vet space, when we we're doing euthanasias, I became very disconnected Um when I was going through compassion fatigue, if we notice these, then approach the person and say, are you okay? Just take them aside for a moment. I've noticed that there's some changes in, in how you're responding and, and I want to support you in this space. And, and do you need someone just to have a coffee with and talk to, you know, I think that's really important as well that we support each other because when we are really in the thick of it, do we have the ability to ask for help? Not always. Oh. No, that's so true. And, you know, that compassion, we need to be able to give it to each other. But if we're running out of it ourselves and we're not, we're not aware of so much of what's going on around us, but, but it's more likely someone in our team that will notice and, and can tune in. And it's interesting that a lot of the signs of compassion fatigue actually correlate with signs of, of mental illness like depression and anxiety. So it's always worthwhile having a bit of a check-in with someone when you notice that they're having those mood, you know, their mood's a bit different to what they normally are. Or they're a bit reactive and they're not normally like that or they just mm-hmm. don't have the same. They're not bringing their usual self to work uh, to just check in, isn't it? Mm. Mm. 100%. And I think that's where that compassionate leadership point fits so well that Beck was what you were saying Mm. before was because you know as a leader if you can notice those shifts and changes in your team members and they you know and you have built a system in place in your team where you round you know you sit with a team member every month for one hour and you have those discussions um, that can also be something that is a really supportive thing that your team members come to rely on and um, you as leader and leader as coach even um, can really make a change to the organisational systems and how your staff feel and it also leads to your staff feeling safe and valued in your team. Absolutely. And when your team feels safe and valued, then you're going to get more from them in, in the workspace because they're going to be so empowered and energised to, to be able to complete those tasks or, you know, to get that project complete. Um, yep. No matter how busy your week is, you're going to work together better, um, yep. connect together. Yeah. yeah. And it's funny that this sort of conversation and having time with your staff to, you know, round with them and sit with them, 
is considered such a soft skill. So it's a non-tangible, soft, caring skill. And so sometimes in leadership circles, it's not valued well. And so your hard skills of KPIs and measurement tools and all those sorts of things that are, you know, are the valuable, tangible, touchable, measurable things. Whereas that soft skill of reaching out and connecting and creating is, yeah, is... um. It's hard to get to somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it is more focused on the harder things, on how you're going to push your team forward, you're going to make yeah. those, you know, check off all those things. But it, I think the most important thing is actually how your team is going. And, and how they're feeling. Mm, yeah, yeah. How, they, how they're feeling and, you know, okay, you haven't met that KPI. What's going on? Is there something I can do to help you in that space? Yes, You know, correct. rather than... Yeah, rather than coming down on them, if you haven't met your KPIs, we're really disappointed in you and, and you know, which happens, you know, yes. um, in the workplace. It's reality. Um, but let's have a softer, more compassionate uh, yes. mindset when we're approaching that. Mm. Celeste, have you got anything else before you go today? Because I know you're about to zip off. Yes, I'll have to zip off. No, because we have to give you compassion because you're <laughs> you've got like all this work out on the farm at the moment. So <laughs> what what just give us your one solution that you love giving to people who are compassion, you know, to think on compassion fatigue. What's your what's your thing? Uh, it, it's that uh, my mantra has been awareness brings change. If you, if we know, if we can tune into ourselves, that's how we get the awareness. And, and if you can find some way to access mindfulness, uh, whether it's just, you know, setting an alarm on your phone to push the pause button and just stop and tune in, how am I feeling? What are the predominating thoughts in my head and tuning into like, is my heart going fast? Am I feeling really anxious? And what do I need to do? What action do I need to take to act on that? Or whether it's actually meditation or whether it's when you go have a cup of tea, that it's a mindful process that you're tuning in and using all your senses. Anything that can help you to use all your senses and just be grounded in the moment is going to help you tune into yourself to notice how you're tracking and then be able to determine from there what action you need to take to help yourself. That's all. And that's, mm. that's it, isn't it? It's ch- tuning in and being aware and then taking your authentic action that works for you. Yeah. 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 And sometimes that takes a bit of working out. You don't, it doesn't oh. mean you just get this divine sudden inspiration. Um, <laughs> it's a work in progress and ease up. Like we, we don't, you don't have to have the answers now. You don't have to have things perfect. Just, just take it easy and, um, and look after yourself because you're worth it. And talk to others. Like, you know, this mm. is why like there is the coaching industry is really getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day in Australia because it's found to be a platform that helps people find their their sources of solutions for compassion fatigue really well. That's it, because we have the answers in ourselves, don't we? Yes. But sometimes we need some help to tease it out. Exactly. Mm. Well, thank you, Celeste. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Beck. Great to have you on board yeah, today. Yeah, thank you, Celeste. Yeah. Thank you and, so uh, much. Talk to you soon. All right. Well, Beck, what else did you want to touch base upon before we wrap it up today? Yeah, I just really loved what Celeste had to say about, you know, checking in with yourself. And I think that's oh. a really important thing that I talk about to my clients is self-check-ins. And, and when we do those self-check-ins and, and how we can schedule those into our our day even and, and remind ourselves to do them. And I think that was, you know, a really great point from her of, yeah, we do have to be able to learn to check in with ourselves. And it's not something oh. we know how to do automatically. Um, no. So I kind of, I use a red light system, you know, um, before when we get to work and we're sitting in the, the car um, waiting to go in, a great thing is stop for a second and have a think about how we're having that mindful moment Let's yep. just do a little bit of a, a self-check. How yep. am I feeling mentally? Um, how's my body feeling? Is there any pain, discomfort? Have I nurtured it? Have I given enough food um, before I walk in and, and, and step into that workplace today? And then, okay, my amber light is I now know what I need for my body. How am I going to implement them? What am I going to need to do that? Green light is going into the workplace 
And if you need some support on that day is talking to someone and, and asking for that support, making sure that you have your lunch break or your cup yep. of tea break in the morning um, and, and just making sure that, yeah, you, you've done that self-check. Um, yep. Another great time is after work. Yep. How am I going to leave work and leave work at work and go home and, and be with my family or my friends yeah. or even myself and yeah. be okay with that? Yeah. yeah. No, and yeah. I so agree with that. And I know, um, yeah, once again, when I'm doing my coaching with my groups and stuff like that, I offer like a lot of, because we have to learn how to check in with self and we have to find our mm. authentic way. So your authentic way there, you're saying, is your traffic light system. But for others who are still like going, oh, I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out my way, you know, like emotional guidance scales, um, you know, yeah. gratitude, um, gratitude journaling. Like there is a lot of different methods out there for checking in with self. Um, and it's about picking that tool that authentically works for you and going, Mm, how can I use this now, you know, and yep. time of day even, you know, I know a lot of people who, yeah, like yourself, check in in the morning when they wake up and go, okay, systems check, how's my head, how's my heart, how's my, you know, how's my spirit, okay, good, 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 I'm ready to go, and then you've got other people who at the end of the day going, how did today go, how did I work today, was I positive, minded or was I negatively minded? So they do mind checks, you know, and that's yeah. their system. So it's, and it, it's, it is about being authentic to yourself with yeah. that as well. You know, I had a lady the other day say to me, oh, I've, I went and bought this journal because all my friends were journaling and I thought, why not? And she goes, I could not write in that journal. And then I, we had this conversation about her creativity and she's this creative artist. And I was like, okay, so what does a journal actually look for you? And she's like, pictures and uh, not words you know just taking a photo and putting it in or or drawing that emotion or you know just it was completely different to how her friends exactly. were journaling but that's that's what worked for her so go ahead with that and and um and she's now successfully journaling her way um and I think yeah being authentic to how that works but learning how to do it what's what works for you is important. Yeah, exactly. And in that same vein, I had a client with a similar thing, but theirs was on the medit. They had an issue with meditation because they had oh, been yeah. with someone else who had told them that they really needed to quieten their mind and meditation is a good tool to do that. And they said they got so turned off because they had a go at meditation and they just failed. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, how, like, could you just tell me how you think you failed at meditation? Because I don't know what you, what was the meditation you were doing? Like, what was that all about? She said, well, I sat and I was trying to do this meditation, but my mind kept wandering off to, you know, oh, have I fed the cats? Did I feed the dogs? Oh, I didn't do that. And I said, oh, but what did you do when your mind drifted off to those spaces? And she said, well, I tried to get it back on track to just sitting quietly. And I said, you didn't fail. That's meditation. Yeah. I said, meditation is that it is sort of your head got noticing that you are thinking about the dog and you are thinking about the cat and you are thinking about other things but then you're actually there going no I'm coming back to this moment I'm just sitting with myself now and however you sit with yourself in the now is meditation there is actually no right or wrong way to do it but I think we have this perception that we must sit on top of the mountain and have no thought to be with yeah, yourself. And I and think it's social not media how it is. And, <laughs> no, I think social media and the TV and, you know, all that kind of brings that perception into our lives of what that must look like. But, and, and for experienced meditation um, practitioners, oh. they're so wonderful to watch. Yes. But in reality, for someone who's learning how to meditate, he's just starting out, you who's know? Just starting out, yeah. It, it, and it does take time. And and um, I'll say to um, my daughter has autism and ADHD, but she likes to find mindful and meditation moments. But hers a lot of the time is using sensory components at the same time. So whether she's got some Zen balls in her hand that she's, you know, moving around to bring that yes. moment. So her body is still moving in a way, but mm -hmm. she's still having that moment of mindfulness and meditation. 
Yes. yes, absolutely. It looks different for everyone. And, um, and we have to just know that, yeah, it's okay that what works for you might not work for everyone else. But exactly. um, once again, that's yeah. giving ourselves permission. Um, yeah, but that's what I was like, because when this client told me that, I sort of said, oh, you be kind to yourself. Like, it's not about yeah. failing. It's just about going, did I actually like doing that or no? Did it just feel a bit weird to me and I didn't feel comfortable? And if it doesn't feel comfortable and it's not really your you, then, you know, don't do it. Go find a new, go and experiment with another activity because there are so many different things for self-care out there that will float your boat, really. Yeah, absolutely. So many things yeah. out there. Just yeah. finding that way, whether What's... it's meditation, mindfulness or flow, like you might just yes. need to go and find that moment of flow, you know. Yeah, what's your favourite? activity. What's your favourite um, thing for just gathering yourself, Beck? So I've just recently moved onto property. I lived in um, rural spaces and I've explored a lot through camping. And um, I love actually getting up in the morning and just going for a walk around my property with my dog. Um, yep. I probably do it at about 6.30 at the moment in the morning. It's been a bit crispy. Um, but I, I rug up and, yeah. and I just have that moment and I just go for a walk and then connect with nature, come back in and and bring that you know, space um, and that calmness into life. And I'll do that during the day as well. If yep. like yesterday I was really busy doing paperwork and um, a grant application and I was like, oh, it's really taking it out on me. Oh, I'm just going to go out in the veggie patch. Yep. I'm just going just gonna to pull some weeds. I didn't plant anything. It's a bit too cold. <laughs> but I'll, I'll pull some weeds and, and have that moment. <laughs> Yes. To nurture myself in that space. So that's my favourite way of doing yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm probably not too dissimilar to that if I think about my solutions. It's, you know, I really have to walk every day. Like that's, I do walking yeah. mindful, mindfulness. Like I just like my to just acknowledge how my feet connect with the earth and, you know, and how I can walk in silence and stuff and, and greening, you know, that same thing of connecting with the earth and doing gardening. And, you know, I, I live in the city, but I'm very fortunate that I have a big block of land. And so I have quite an extensive garden that, you know, you just go out and if it's just watering, I'll go out and just water. And then if I see some brown leaves, well, I might pull those brown leaves off. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's just that connecting with living, breathing things, you know, that are, yeah, Absolutely. yeah, that are part of our world, you know? Yeah. And it's just getting, feeling that breath of yeah. the wind on you or, or that cool, crisp morning air, you know, how it feels on your body and um, yeah, just getting outside. When we're in the care industry, a lot of the time we are inside so much, we're in hospitals or we're in a veterinary clinic or we're in a space where we're inside and we just do not get outside enough. So connecting with nature and getting outside, I think is really important. And um, yeah. I have started a program specifically um, with another coach, Nadine, around connecting out with nature and doing coaching in nature. And it's um, really beautiful space to be oh, in. So There is so much literature that talks about green spacing and positive mental health. Like you can... Yeah. Oh, it is quite, and it's it's a bigger area of mental health um, sort of care that is getting bigger and bigger. So you're definitely in the beginning of a growth industry with that way of being in your coaching. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful space to be in, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, so I think, yeah, that's, you know, a lot, there's a lot about compassion out there. It doesn't matter, as I said, whether you're in the industry of care or whether you're just a person that care is a caring person, you know, I think that's oh, a compassionate exactly. person, you know, yeah. um, it's important to be aware of, of how to balance our compassion and, um, yeah. and ask yeah. yourself, can I give anything today or do I need to give to myself today? And that's okay to yeah. give to yourself. Today might be yeah, my or- day of self-care. All right, cool. Yeah. Do I need to ask someone for a bit of care? Do I need to have someone over for a coffee? You know, yes. um, accept that hug. I was very poor at accepting hugs um, my whole life. I have found that a very vulnerable space. And I'd actually used to say to people, I'm not a hugger. 
before we would do anything. I'm not a hugger. And that's how negative that space was for me. And now actually I embrace hugs and I love it when people give me that compassion and kindness. Yeah. Um, and I'm really honest that that was the space I was in. You know, it was, um, you could ask my friends. I would literally say, oh, I'm not a hugging person. You know, don't you don't need to touch me. I'm okay. But now I'm like, you know, let's, You're let's hug in. it out. You're yeah, all let's in. Let's do it. Let's hug it out. <laughs> I love it. I'm a bit like that as well. And probably, yeah, I think in my time, I must admit, I, I was a good friend of mine. She she made that assumption about me once. And she said, oh, but Sue, you're not a hugger either. And I was almost like, yeah, I am a hugger. Why do you think I'm not a hugger? I don't know. Why? What? And I was, I probably spent, you know, probably a couple of days ruminating on the fact that someone thought I, who I really admired and respected, thought what didn't think I was a hugger. I was like, Oh my God, have I not a good, have I got not clear perception of myself at the moment? What's going on with that? So that became a full mm-hmm. analysis for me for a few days. But anyway, I did get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's just allowing those simple things. I think, you know, but it is such a big thing um, when you're in that space of <laughs> I'm not a hugger, don't hug me. And then when you realize actually, hold on, it was just me being really fearful and and afraid and anxious about what happens when someone hugs me and when I actually accept that and take that in. And then yep. it's now okay. Like I love that. I love receiving that compassion and love for someone yes. um, and that kindness that someone wants to give me if they see I need it in that space. Yes. Time, so, it's yeah. so true. Oh, well, I could go, you and I could sit here and talk all day, but that part just... <laughs> <laughs> that might tire yeah. everyone out that we're speaking to today. But we can come back and have another perspective on this another time in another chat anyway, Beck. So is there anything yeah. you'd like to finish off with today? Just to say, hey, thanks. Anything, uh, I don't know, any pivotal moment that you'd like to just get people to think on before we sign off for the day? I just think um, if you're in a leadership space, it doesn't matter where you are in that space of leadership. Just think about how you can be a compassionate leader. Um, I think it's really important. Um, And, you know, if you know someone that's in your team or a friend or family that might be in a caring space um, or a really compassionate person, maybe just reach out and ask, you know, how do you need some compassion or uh, how are you going? How are you doing? And how can I maybe help you in that space? Um, And then, you know, once again, us just, being aware that it's okay to give ourselves permission. We don't yeah. have to have other people giving us permission to, yeah. to feel compassion to ourselves and to receive it from other people. Yeah. And I think we really went over that well in this podcast today and yeah. um, I really hope that that resonates with some people. And, and if you do need support, absolutely, you know, connect with Sue or myself or, or Celeste in that yeah. area and see how we can help you as well. 100%. Yeah. And just to add to that, you know, um, you know, leaders need coaching too. Like, you know, mm. so many leaders are in the position as a leader, but they don't necessarily have the right qualifications to be there. They, they, they got it thrust upon them. Sometimes they didn't ask for it. And so, you know, as a leader, don't be you don't feel like it's shame to ask for help, to ask, you know, to lean on someone to go, how could I do be a leader with more compassion? How could I learn to be a leader who, you know, gets more out of my staff without fear or intimidation? Like, you know, how as a leader could I learn more? And, you know, ask for help as well. I think is really important. There's so much out there in the material and literature that can help you. You just have to, ask yeah absolutely what might be a good read for me as as someone in this space but I think we spend a lot of time as professionals doing CPD points and and extra education around our area of expertise you know for a vet we might do some extra surgical or ultrasound not get gaining knowledge in that space or as a nurse it might be anesthetics but if you're a leader in the space in in any industry it's how can I actually increase my leadership skills? How exactly. can I support that stuff? How can I become emotionally aware? How can I become, have really good communication skills, compassionate skills? And as I said, leading with your team rather than yeah. for your team. 
is really exactly important. you know yeah. great work well thank you for joining us today on the what's with health and care podcast and being our friend um, we um, hope you enjoyed today, you, you, you people, you good folk listening out there. We hope you enjoyed today. And um, if you want to follow us, please, we, you know, you can follow us on our podcast, follow us on our um, Facebook page. Um, of course, Beck's details will all be there for you. If you want to connect in with Beck after today, you'll have all of those details as well. And thanks for listening. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks when we're inspired by another friend to have another good conversation. See you back. Yeah. Thank Bye. you.